Hello? Hello? Okay. I'm doing something different. Sorry. My first time doing this. And so I'm actually nervous. Okay. We'll be talking on, uh, I'm going to bring it up again, but there's a scripture that, that kind of like the, that the Lord, I felt impressed on my heart and gave me this, this new year. It's in first Timothy four fifteen. It's just, it's about growth and I'll get into it, uh, into it later, but, um, about progressing and growing. And this is one of the things that, that I felt the Holy Spirit challenging me in is growing. Because for me, being up, I'm not, um, like I think my dad has told us many times, if you've come to this church for any time, that he, that he shared stories about his, uh, I guess there was a struggle, even a fear of public speaking. And so that kind of got passed down to me and I'm still working on that, trying to be more comfortable in front of people, in front of you guys. And one of the things that I've been holding on to um, till the very end is the mic. Because I felt that, you know, I mean, it could be, it could be, a, it could be a music stand, a podium, whatever. But the mic for me was kind of like my safety blanket. Like, was it Linus with his blanket or whoever it was? You know, my, my daughter, Micah, she still has her manky. And if, if, if that manky is not around at nap time or bedtime, she's like, she's not taking a nap. But as soon as you put that on her, she's out, right? So for me, that's something that, that, I, that I'm trying to, to move on with and trying to grow and uh, being able to have two hands. So I'm used to having this hand, like doing something the whole time, right? Speaking. And so it's going to look awkward. Like, I don't know what I'm going to be able to do with this hand, you know? So anyway, so... That's what I, I just wanted to kind of give that and, and say it before, before I do anything weird with my hands this, this, uh, this morning. But we're going to continue on in our authentic series this morning. So let's go back into our book, Philippians. Hopefully there's somewhat of a, of a, a, a natural opening that your Bible is opening up to that by now. I think this is our fifth week um, this morning on authentic, um, just a Christian lifestyle. And it's going to be in Philippians 3, starting in verse 7. And our 7 through 21. So let me take a drink. And we can get started. I'm going to have to get used to how to block that off. Because usually I can just take the mic away when I cough. So it's, if I sneeze or cough, forgive me already. I don't have the natural resources to, or the natural whatever mindset to do that. So Philippians 3, 7 and verse 12. Or seven, and we're going to be reading through verses 21. All right, here we go. It says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. Let's, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all that you have done in our lives, for even all that we've experienced even this morning, being able to come back into fellowship and unity inside um, this 
these four walls, this church building, Lord, to, to, to see people that we love, that, that we've done time with, and that we've grown to develop our relationship with them and with you through that, Lord. So we just thank you for these precious Sunday mornings that we're able to celebrate you and celebrate all that you've done in our lives. We ask, God, that you would use me to just communicate what you've placed on my heart and that it would uh, propel us forward into continuing this lifestyle of authentically living for you, Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think, it's, I think it's fair to say for the most part that most people here, if not all of us, have some, have some time in our lives been to visit a doctor, whether it be just through a normal checkup or whether it be through surgery, ER room, whatever it might be, that, that most of us here have been to a doctor. And I think that it's also fair to say that, that there are some, maybe not as many that have been to a doctor, but there are still some that have, that have rode on an airplane before in their lifetimes. Um, there might be some, hopefully here, whether it was being, being, uh, being able to go for work, for vacation, or visit a loved one's. And still there might be others of us here, hopefully, that not hopefully, but there still might be others of us that have been to a restaurant before. Um, you go out one night and you go to a restaurant and you're thinking, man, I don't want to cook dinner and I especially don't want to do the dishes afterwards, right? So we go to dishes, but go, go to dinner out as a family. In that exchange or in that experience, what are we inevitably looking to experience. One of the things that as I was studying this scripture and that I was, I was able to kind of pull out for us this morning is that whether we're going to a doctor, whether we're going on a flight, whether we're going to a restaurant, whether we're, we're calling a plumber for some issue or HVAC technician, electric, whatever it might be, whenever we get some type of a service, we are trying to get some form or some type of excellence. This morning, we're going to be talking on authentically living a life of excellence. That when we go to a doctor's office, we don't just want some shoddy surgeon or some shoddy doctor going to his office and it's all picked up. There's trash all over. Um, I don't know if you guys ever seen Minority Report. We don't want someone like that working on us that worked on Tom Cruise. If you haven't seen that movie, then you are, uh, you are a saint. If you have, I'm going to pray for you. You shouldn't be watching that stuff. We, I'm, it, yeah, exactly. Bless you. <laughs> don't go see it after I said anything. Yeah, I guess you'd, you'd run it unless it's that heritage. But also when we fly, when we get on an airplane, we don't want a pilot that was last in his class, right? We don't want someone that was graded on the curve. We don't want someone that's like, hey, he's good. He landed safely one out of 10 times. We want someone that was committed to excellence. Same, same with a restaurant. We might not want the same level of excellence as a pilot or as a surgeon, but we expect to be able to pay, when we pay our hard-earned money, that there is gonna be something brought back that, that able to, to kind of equal to what I pay. And there needs to be some level of accept our excellence that I should expect in each of these transactions. And even though we um, really want to experience that level of excellence, I think that many times those that want that level of excellence in, in, in some of their lifestyles and some of their choices and some of their habits, they might not be actually living a life of excellence in and, in and of themselves. We've been going through this, this series again, authentic and just kind of having the dot, dot, dot so that we're filling it in. First, we talked on authentic joy. Then we talked on authentic relationship. We talked on authentic fellowship. My dad talked on authentic good works. And I really love the quote that he, he brought up last week. It said, salvation is not a result of works, but it's the vehicle by which we do good works. And something that I, that I think that is, that is just so profound in that, um, in that, in that quote is that we need to understand that it's not anything that I do in and of myself, but it's all because of what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us, that we can go out and we can perform those good works. And I wanted to piggyback on that, on that sermon and that idea of authentic good works with excellence, that we, as a people of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, that we are to not only go out and perform good works, but those good works are to be excellent. 
That there is a level of excellence that we are placing upon ourselves because we have a salvation through Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man, the one who is fully God and fully man, that it is his lifestyle that we are following after. We're not going to be able to be perfect, but Paul says in another, in another text that we are being perfected until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to continue to grow our lifestyle, grow our habits, grow who we now are in Christ Jesus, that those that have repented of our sins and placed our hope, placed our trust, placed our love, our adoration upon Jesus Christ, that there is a growing, that there is a developing inside of our lifestyle, and that lifestyle is to display excellence. Paul prays in the beginning of this letter to the Philippians in chapter one, verses nine through 11. And it says, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What he's doing here, and I believe what the Holy Spirit is using this text through Paul is telling us um, this morning is that I want you to approve what is excellent. I want you to know it, but that there's not just a knowing like surface level, but that there's a deep definition and a defining for each and every one of us that we would truly know and have the knowledge of what excellent is so that we can mature and develop in the realm of excellence. So the more we see and understand excellence, the more accessible it will be to live out excellence in our daily lives. And that is what Paul is trying to encourage the church of Philippi and each and every one of us, that as we continue to focus on, grow in the knowledge of this excellence, that it would be easier for us to actually live out and demonstrate that excellence in our daily lifestyles. That we as believers are to live out lives of excellence. And I have a question here is, do you believe that? Do you believe, do you believe that you are to live out your life with excellence? that there needs to be an understanding for me, for you, that when we come in relationship with this personal God, that there is an excellence that is to be lived out. It's called discipleship, that we are discipling, that there's a discipline in our lifestyle that is following hard after Jesus Christ. That we as believers in Christ Jesus are to do good works and those good works are to be done with excellence. So what is excellence? I have a couple definitions here. Excellence is the quality of being outstanding or extremely good. It's not like Zoolander, really, really, really good looking, right? It's going above, that, that could be excellence, I guess, if you want. That's another movie that, that's kind of out there. My, it was one of my wife's favorites when I started dating her. I was like, no, we can't watch that once we're married. You gotta let that go, okay? The word excel is defined to do or be better than or to surpass. It's a quality that surpasses ordinary standards. Many times that when there is excellence, there's the stopping and appreciating of a job well done. My dad shared a story last week. Um, did he, he did a good job last week, right? I mean, it was, you, you know, it's like, there's some sermons, you know, they're good, but that sermon was like, I'm still trying to listen to it. It was meaty, right? And uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. But he shared a story about going to Redding, California in our old green van. I mean, that was back in the day when you didn't need seatbelts, right? We used to travel in that thing laying on the floor. We'd wake up early in the morning, four or five in the morning and take a long trip down to California usually. We were living in, in was it at, in southern, southern Oregon, Ashland? And uh, we would just lay on the bottom, be nice and warm and they just drive. You can't do that anymore, right? Because there was no seats in the middle. It was like a bench seat in the back and a side bench seat. And it, it was a trip, but he, tell, he told the story, if you weren't here last week, um, about going and we were eating breakfast or eating at a restaurant in Reading in our old green van. It said, God is love on the spare tire. And there was some people apparently that were watching and uh, just watching our family. They knew that was our van outside. And so they were like, hey, let's see if this is real. So apparently they were watching our family during our time of eating at a restaurant. And they noticed something they said that was different about our family. Apparently my brothers and I must've still been sleepy right? Because 
if, if you would have known us growing up. I wish there was some, I mean, there was some here that, that, that might have been still here, but in our old building that used to be a little bit forward. I used to sit front row by my mom. My brothers used to sit behind me and they used to hit me, you know, knock me until I turned around and like, ah, you know, just a fit of rage would happen. And then it was like, she turned around all three of us, wait till we get home from church. And you know, then we're quiet. But so, so I mean, there must've been something special. God placed an anointing on us as kids, not to act out of hand or something for them to see that our, that our family was, uh, was displaying love. But, but is there a display in our lifestyle of love? a display of excellence, that that is what God is calling us to, that people are looking to us. They're looking at us. If they have, if they have come to know that we are Christians, and I know maybe, maybe, maybe you haven't, maybe you don't tell people because you want to live that old lifestyle. But what we as disciples, as true believers of Christ, is we are called to live a life of excellence, that there's supposed to be a pursuit, okay? So excellence from the viewpoint of this world is often defined in terms of, of competition, that it's surpassing others. Um, I've, I've confessed to a couple of people this week that, you know, I'm just getting too much into sports this year. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I have a son now, but NFL Combine's going on. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to outdo one another in all their different positions. And that is the viewpoint, that is the mindset of this world that I am trying to outdo you, that I'm trying to surpass you, that there, there needs to be something of a better quality in me than there is of you. And that's what the world sees. It's surpassing others. It's usually for self-glory or a sense of independent significance. It's to achieve the praise and applause of other people. But when we think of the pursuit of excellence from a biblical perspective, it's different. When we view it with a, with a biblical perspective, excellence is a virtue. That it is a virtue in our lifestyle. That it is supposed to be a part of who we now are that we as disciples of Jesus should pursue excellence at all times. Just to kind of throw some, some information out there, the opposite of excellence is mediocrity. It's barely getting by. It's doing just enough. That is not the life that God has called us to, of barely getting by. When he calls us, he calls us to a life of extravagance, a life that is overflowing. Amen? Amen that it's not just barely getting by, but oftentimes we kind of have that mentality in our life that I'm supposed to be poor and lowly and uh, but God calls us to a life of abundance, of flowing out, that there's not, I don't even have room to contain the blessing and inheritance that God has for me that I must go and display and pass it out to others around me, that that is a life. That's some good notes right there because my dad's gonna be speaking authentic generosity. Praise the Lord. My, my dad last week, again, he talked on good works. And when we become believers, we are to live out our lives in good works to bring glory to God. Psalm 8 verses 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. We see here that it says that his very name is excellent. And we as believers, we that have been called out of darkness, in darkness into his marvelous light are to display his name, his name of excellence, his name of goodness, his name that is glorious, that we are to live out that and to make his known. We love hearing about how God called me out of darkness. We love to be able to see when the spotlight is on God and how good he is and that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly and we yell and raise our hands and do all that kind of stuff. But what happens when the spotlight makes its way over to our, ourselves or even to our lives? Is there a display of that exceedingly abundantly in our life or is it a life of mediocrity? Is it a life of humdrum? Am I really only doing just enough just to get by? Because we love to hear that. I love to hear it. I'll be up shouting if someone starts quoting that, that scripture out of Ephesians or any of those other ones where we kind of get emotionally high off of. But what happens when the spotlight is on us? Because we are to be the ones in this land that live out that type of lifestyle here in earth that we are to live out the exceedingly abundantly because we do have the Holy Spirit present inside of each and every one of us that have called upon him. Are we expecting it out of our own lifestyle? Whether we were washing dishes at home 
or washing dishes for a living, whether we, we own a business, we run a business, or we're an employee, whatever it might do that God is calling us to do all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, excuse me. And whatever you do, do it heartily or earnestly or authentically as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Sorry. For you serve the Lord Christ. So in these verses alone, there is basic theology. Theology is the study of God and of our biblical beliefs. So in that, there's this theological truth that runs in there that's a foundational part of our faith and our daily walk of disciples of Jesus Christ. And that is that in all things, we as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to pursue excellence to the glory of God. That whatever it might be, it could be something minimal or something extravagant. Whatever it might be, what we are doing, our time at home, our time at our careers, even in our hobbies, that we are to do it for the glory of God, that there is an excellence about us. I'm getting closer and closer to you, Kathy. <laughs> Aristotle, who I believe is not a Christian, ancient Greek philosopher, he had this to say. It says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act but a habit. When we pursue excellence, it's not a destination, but it's, it's not a destination, but it's a direction. The early believers, um, in in Acts, it says that the early believers were called Christians in Antioch. That is what the world called them was Christians. It was little Christ, but what did they call themselves and their choice and their lifestyle? It was called the way that it was a way of life for them, that their life, their discipleship of following after Christ was called the way, that this pursuit of excellence is a way of life, that it is to how we are to live our lives in every aspect of our lives. That's a way of life as we follow after Christ, who was excellent and perfect in everything that he did. Excellence, again, means being your best, but not the best. It means being better tomorrow than you were yesterday that there's an intention or exerting an effort, that we put forth a discipline, that there's discipline, there's um, boundaries in our lives to continue to pursue excellence in our lifestyle. Uh, one of the churches that we are a part of one, of, the, one of the things that made the most impact on me was when I heard about this, this home group of these, they were all businessmen in this church and they used to get together um, I, think it was, I think it was on a Saturday morning. They would go to breakfast together. There was four or five of them. And they would ask each other hard questions about their purity, about their business practices, about their personal practices, about their relationships, that there was a knitting, that they were putting boundaries, that they were putting discipline in their own lifestyle enough that they were accountable to other people. So that... They were open enough with them so that when they asked them the tough questions that they would actually divulge anything that possibly was going on. And it wasn't to be, oh, got you this week. Oh, no, it was there because they were there to watch and help each other pursue excellence together. That there was a a unit, that there was a family developed inside of those businessmen that they would be able to excel and pursue Christ together in all their actions, in their marriages, in their businesses, in their disciplines of life that they would continue to pursue that. And that is something that, that we need to have in our own lifestyle because excellence, to actually pursue excellence, there needs to be a, a pursuing of others that are around you that are excellent. I, I had a guy that I used to work with at, at a company and he used to say, he had a lot of sayings. I can't say most of them here. But he had one saying that many of you guys would hear is when anything went wrong or someone would mess up, make his mistake, it was with a job, he would always say, it's hard to fly like an eagle when you're working with a bunch of turkeys. Right? You ever hear that? Who are you hanging out with? Who do you hold company with? Are they holding you back from pursuing excellence? Or are they actually pushing you forward into what God has called you to do? What we see in our text this morning, I believe, is that Paul is giving us a template 
of a lifestyle of authentic excellence. And the first thing that he begins to think that I, that I see in our text is that there is a shifting that needs to take place in our thinking, that there's a mentality change that needs to take place. So first off is there's this establishing of excellent thoughts. Philippians 3.15 says, Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. So he's saying, have this mind. So to live out an authentic life of excellence, you have to develop a mindset to do it first and foremost. What does Paul say in this? He says, as many as are mature. So Paul is trying to bring these believers of Philippi to a place of actually taking inventory of their thoughts. And that is something that we need to develop as believers in Christ, that we need to take inventory of our thought life. What are we thinking about? What are we giving our mind to? Proverbs uh, 23 that says, for as a man thinketh, so is he. I used it a couple weeks ago. So whatever he thinks, pretty soon that's going to be who he is. He's going to give himself to his thoughts. Our thoughts are like the roots are, that are in like plants or trees. That those roots, that, that, that is our thought life. And eventually whatever we're thinking is going to eventually come out in our actions, in our lifestyles, in our attitudes, in our habits, whatever it might be. And we've seen many things, many of us we grew up around agriculture, know that when the root starts to decay, start to die off, when there's some disease, that pretty soon it's gonna kill that plant and eventually ruin the whole crop around us, right? That is something that we need to know and understand and develop in our own lives. Do we have a mindset? Do we have a mentality? Do I have a, an established thinking life to pursue excellence every day I get up? Or is it just a one-time thing? Maybe, you know, whatever it might be. Only when something big is going on do I need to pursue excellence in it. Or is there something that I can be excellent in the small things as well as the big thing, that there needs to be a character development in my life? So is there maturity in my walk or is it still childish? Am I still walking my Christian faith out in a childish way or am I trying to develop it, my maturity in Christ, in the Lord? Something that, I, that I've discovered in my very few little years of being a pastor of a church that I've discovered is, is not everyone that comes through those doors and comes and sits down where you guys may be sitting are actually serious about their walk. That there's some that may know, um, know some verses, we know all the songs, maybe even lift their hands, but they are really not serious or take their faith seriously in their Christian walk that there needs to be something going on in our lives to have the thought life, to live a life of excellence, to pursue excellence in all that we have and all that, that God has given us, that he has called us to be good stewards. So even how we approach our spiritual life, our spiritual life doesn't just involve when we come into this building or when we gather in a small group or whatever it might be in any facet of just a Christian congregation that there shouldn't be a differentiating between two different lifestyles, but that it is I am who I am no matter where I go, no matter who's around me or who is not, whether I'm home alone in my own home office or whether I'm in front or in, in a pew at church, that I am the same person, that I have become a mature believer enough to know that I am who I say I am and that other people know who I am. That I, have, that I have a name for myself. So developing a lifestyle of excellence begins with a mindset to settle for nothing less. So what is Paul's basis for excellent thinking? It's in Philippians 3, 8. It says, yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. After all Paul had attained and accomplished, he still maintained a mind totally focused on Jesus. He's saying what I believe is that when I focus solely on Jesus, my life will exemplify a life of excellence. Having our mind on Christ is a sign of maturity. That when that becomes our thinking life as we wake up in the morning, 
before our feet hit the floor that we're thinking about God's love, about his extravagance, about what Jesus has done for our life. Before we lay our heads down on our bed, that that, that is something that, that allows us to take over our thoughts. And if you struggle with, with sleeping, that's something that I do. I, I'm out like a light. I'm, I mean, I'm not saying that's like it's going to cure you or whatever, but but you know, if, if, if there is something of being right with God before you fall asleep, that there's, there's no worry, there's no anxiety, but knowing, knowing who you are, knowing who he's called you to be. But is that something that, that takes over our thought life throughout the day, that no matter where we're at, that we have the mentality, we have the focusing on Jesus in our life, that that is a sign of maturity. It's, it's realizing how much we don't know. I love it when, when you talk to older gentlemen, and it could be with whatever career they have, but when they tell you, it's like, you know what? The older I get, the more I don't know. But I've learned the more I don't know. And I love that because that is a sign of humility. Because too often when we are younger, we're ready to take on the world. But sooner or later, we're gonna get kicked down enough from this life knowing that, you know what? Maybe I don't know it all. But it's trying to know the one who does know it all and following after his life, amen? So it's also knowing that God is still at work in me. We read it a couple of weeks ago, Philippians 1, 6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's having that understanding that I don't have to be perfect in the here and now, but it is a way of life. It's not trying to be a destination by the time I'm 40, which is in about a year and a half. <sighs> Man, help me. I can't even grow a beard anymore. It's, it turns white. Anyways, but that I'm not trying to be like a perfect, that there isn't something that I'm trying to attain right here and right now, but that is a way of life that I am continually growing and, and being better than I am tomorrow than I was yesterday, but that there needs to be a maturing. Mature Christians make every effort to build on their faith. Are we making those choices? Are we making that lifestyle change to continue to build upon what we already know or what we've already experienced? Who we know God to be? Is there continual um, studying of God's word to develop who we know of God's character and his nature and his love and his extravagance for us? One thing that I've been, I've been challenged on and uh, I've been talking with my wife so you guys can be ready, but, but there, there, there's going to come a time and, but I have been felt challenged by the Lord to really learn about more about hell. I haven't really talked on it too much or divulged it. And it's like, whoa, you know, just because, you know, I mean, I remember hearing people, you know, fire and brimstone preachers and, and they try and, and scare you into your Christian faith. But something that I've developed is you never, you never know the extravagance of God's love for you until you know all that he saved you from. And so it's not out of trying to fear someone and did you know where you're going? It's sure gonna be hot in hell, right? But it's actually understanding what he saved you from. And that is what I'm trying to learn and develop because I want to grow in God's love. And in seeing the display of God's love for, for me as a believer. But is there in that in our lives of, of learning more about what the word of God says so that I can learn more about God and his nature, that there would be a foundation, that there would be a concrete thought in my mind of knowing that this is God in all his love, in all his extravagance, in all his compassion that he has for me and also for the lost around me. Is, but are we developing? Is there a growing? And what I, what I said before of, of 1 Timothy 4.15, that's the word that, that I felt God gave me for this year, but also for our church. It says, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. He's talking about spiritual gifts and just the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But then he goes on to say that your progress may be evident to all. And that is something that we need to develop, that, that we as believers, that there is an evidence to all our lifestyle that's not only uh, a progress to our lifestyle, that's not only evident to ourselves, but also those that we come around, that we can continue to encourage to pursue excellence with one another. So do I have a mindset to progress or to excel? It takes a mentality change. Second is forgetting the past. Philippians 3, 13 
says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And I know the point can be argued with most of us, with many of us saying that, can you ever really forget? Can I really ever forget? Whatever it might be, past sins, past regrets, um, what people have done to me that have hurt me, can I ever really forget? And we know that, that God can forget. He says it in his word that, that our sins are as far as the east is to the west, that that is as far as he's separated. But how can I actually forget my own past, what I've done, but also what others have done to me? And the word that I was able to discover is that this word in the Greek means to neglect, that there's no longer caring about. It's given over to oblivion and uncared for. That what many, many times we think about, oh, just forget about it. It's not an on-off switch, but that it's a process. That we need to develop a process of forgetting our past. That many, many of us know that if you feed something, that it's going to continue to grow. Well, when we give it time, when we give it the spotlight, when we give it center stage in our life, we are feeding something and it's going to continue to be there. So in the process of forgetting our past, forgetting our past mistakes, what others may have even have done to us, because there needs to be a time of repentance, time of, of asking for forgiveness to God, but also forgiving others. Okay, and when that happens, it's under the blood. Don't try, search, don't try and go and searching for that any longer. But there needs to be a forgetting of actually purposely neglecting of not caring about, of giving, over to, of giving over to oblivion, that I'm not going to think on it any longer because if I continue to think on my past, I'm never gonna make it to the future that God has for me. That God has a plan and a future for each and every one of us. And that is to continue to grow in his grace, grow in, in the knowledge of him, grow in, in the love that he has for us to, to be able to, dis, to display that. So it's a decision that I choose not to think on or dwell on, or care about. That there is a forgetting. It's neglecting the past hurts, pains, and struggles. When we do live in the past, what happens many times is that we're not able to give ourselves fully to our spouse, to our children, even to a career or a job. I know that there was, the, I, I've known men, met many people um, in the workforce. That's where I have most of my life experience, I guess you could say. And, and whether it be with a new job that they got or a new relationship, a, a, the, a new marriage that they got in, you could tell, and you didn't want it to happen, but you could tell that they were going to experience the same exact things because they were reliving those things with their current relationship or with their current job. And that is something that we need to know and understand that before we can move on in that future, that there would be a forgetting, that there would be a letting go of our past. And that is something that we need to continually develop in our lifestyle. So to live a life of excellence means changing location from our past towards our future. It's not living in the rearview mirror. I remember after graduating, uh, I'm actually celebrating my, my 20, I don't know if I'm actually going to celebrate, if I'm going to go, but there's a 20-year uh, reunion for, for my high school coming up. And uh, yeah, so I don't know if I'm going to go, but I remember about, about you know, a couple years after, 10 years after, I mean, it's just down in Sunnyside, but still. I forgot about those days. I don't dwell there. Amen. Anyways, um, what was I thinking? Feel, feeling like my dad right now. Anyways, but I'm not living in the rearview mirror because there are so many people, even after 10 years of, even at the 10 year reunion, or you just experience people's life. I bet you, I bet there's still people that you guys know that are still living back in the high school glory days. That they're still trying to relive being this, whatever, you know, going to basketball in state or doing whatever, that there is a mentality of still trying to rehash those memories. And they're still trying to relive those glory days, living life in a rear view mirror, but they don't, um, they don't really understand or they don't even have a perception of their present state that they're currently dwelling in. 
because they're so focused on the past that they don't even know what life looks like right now. They don't have a clue about their future. And that is something that we need to understand that we're not living in the past. Whether it be bad things or good things. Because both can keep us from our future. Both can keep us from growing. Accomplishments, successes, as well as, fa as failures. So I have, we cannot live on yesterday's successes any more than we can dwell on yesterday's failures. We must be able to remember the less, I'll, I'll repeat that, got a note taker. We cannot live on yesterday's successes any more than we can dwell on yesterday's failures. That we must remember the lesson learned from the past, but not allow the past to dictate our future. Something that, that you see often, if you, if you study anything in, in business, or I'm sure you can just look at smartphones. Always developing something new, always trying to reinvent themselves. And that is, a that is not a biblical principle, a business principle that there always needs to be a reinventing of themselves. We see the names like, like uh, J.C. Penney's or Macy's. I mean, J.C. Penney's still around, but all these big box stores have went under in the past 15, 20 years. Main reason is they thought, they, they dwelt on their past successes and they weren't trying to reinvent themselves. And we see Amazon reinventing themselves every week and they're just growing and taking business away from everybody. So we cannot dwell on past successes even. That it can help propel us forward a little bit, but we don't want to live and take inventory off of that, live our lives off of that. Another thing I read in marriage counseling, um, I thought this could help someone out this morning. One quote I read, it helped, it's going to help me out. I was reading to my wife and then it was like, I looked over and she's like, well, what are you going to do about it? Says being, as I, I just felt, I just felt the glare. It was, my back was to her. I felt it. Says being married is like riding a bike. I should wait till a train goes by just to make sure everyone hears this. You can feel the intensity right now. Okay, we're good. It says being married is like riding a bike. It takes some work and some pedaling. If you're coasting, that means you're going downhill. Right? Come on, somebody. Better take a note on that. What, what, what minute is that on? If you're going to go back and listen to this on YouTube. Even in our Christian faith, if we are... Man, this thing is pulling on me. If we're coasting in our Christian faith, that means that we may be going downhill. So are, are we forgetting, not focusing on any longer, not giving it center stage in our lives? Third and final point is, is we're pressing forward. Philippians 3.14, we see Paul in his display of what was something inside of him. It says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. A life lived in excellence is always looking to excel. The idea given to this word press is running swiftly. It means to pursue in a hostile manner. That it has the idea of trying to overtake something. We see some of this um, just exerting of energy in the Olympics. I don't know if you guys were able to watch any of the Olympics, Summer Olympics, Winter Olympics, whatever it might be, but there's that exertion of these people that I've been training my whole life for this. And it's just in their very nature by this time that they're exerting everything that they have. And when they eventually come across the, the finish line, they just pass out because of all that they've given themselves to. And that is what Paul is trying to, to, to create um, in his word picture that I press on, that I am in hot pursuit of the reason for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me, he said in here. That I want to discover all that God has for me because I know that my life and my current accomplishments are nothing. And so I know that there has to be more in my life that God wants me to do because there would be no reason for him to save me. That we need to know and understand that God has designed us, has called us, has redeemed us to live lives of excellence 
and to continue to pursue what he has for us, to pursue that future, and that needs to be a mindset inside of each and every one of us. It's no longer a mindset of whatever happens, happens, of, of mediocrity, of barely getting jive, I guess it was just meant to be. And the other, the other, the other, the other spectrum of that mentality is perfectionist. Excellence is not perfectionist. Perfectionism has self as its source and object, but excellence has God as its source and object. Perfectionism struggle with self-salvation. That when there is a perfectionist in a relationship that is not only self-destructive, but it can be destructive to relationships because there was such a high standard that no one can attain it. And we need to know that that excellence is not perfectionism that this perfectionism is found in most religions, that I have to obey and be perfect in order to be accepted. But authentic Christianity is that we obey because we are accepted. That it's out of that place of acceptance that we live out our lives. And when we lose our sense of acceptance, we lose our sense of identity. That we can live our lives and allow the old mentality, the old mindset to creep back in. And like my dad said, that we can open the door for demonic activity to take place and, and agree with some things going on. And all of a sudden we start to lose our identity and we start to hear what the enemy has to say inside of our ear. We give him place. We give him a foothold. And sooner or later, when you give the devil a foothold, he's gonna, he's gonna try and make a stronghold in your life. And there's gonna be a, conti- a needing to be able to get rid of a mindset of, a, uh, of a, uh, whatever it might be, an open door for him. And we can lose that sense of identity. We can lose that sense of acceptance that, that we're supposed to have in this salvation. And what Paul does at the end of this chapter is he reminds the people of Philippi and he's reminding us of our identity, that we have acceptance. Philippians 3.20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That our acceptance and our identity are found in our citizenship in heaven, where Jesus Christ is seated, ruling and reigning in heaven. That it's from that citizenship, that it's from that identity, it's from that acceptance, that we can live a life of, ex- of extravagance, we can live a life of excellence, that I have my citizenship in heaven while I'm still dwelling on this earth. And one of the most important things that we need to understand as we grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and seeing his life displayed throughout the gospels and what Paul and, and some of the other apostles write about Jesus Christ in their letters is that the knowledge of a loving father in heaven, of a good father, because a good father does not demand anything from his children that he first hasn't supplied or provided for. That it's not out of my own works. It's not about anything that you have to struggle for or out of your own strength, but that he has given us his Holy Spirit to be able to live out an extravagant life and a life of excellence, one that is an authentic Christian life. Amen? There was a story I, I read about recently about these young individuals, of course, men. And uh, they were going swimming in a river. It was springtime, something that's going to happen pretty soon. And they were going um, kind of up in the mountains and, and just kind of do their own polar bear club, jumping in this ice cold water and swim in the river. And, and something that they really didn't know was, was that, there, that, that, that the, the, uh, the snow and a lot of the glacial stuff had, had melted, so the river was a lot faster than it was normally in the summer. And so one, one of the individuals, this one guy jumped in the river and he wasn't expecting how cold it was and also how fast the current was. And all of a sudden he got taken downstream and it, he entered into this dangerous rapid area. And so, so his friends kind of were trying to run along shore with him and trying to yell at him, but one of the friends was on the shore and he was an experienced lifeguard. And so one of the friends like remembered that as they were struggling, like go in, go in and save him. You're a lifeguard. Come on, go in. What are you doing? And they said that the guy was just sitting there waiting, kind of just staring. And they didn't know that it was like, you know, uh, the freeze or or the, the fight, whatever it might, flight or fight. And he was just staring there watching this guy as he was struggling in the rapids, trying to, to get every breath of air that he could. 
And they said they were yelling at him continuously until all of a sudden they noticed that the friend that was in the water started to give up and began to drown. He didn't have any more energy left. And it was that, that's when his friend, the lifeguard, jumped in and he saved him. And just like a couple swift strokes went in and saved him and grabbed him out. And his friend's like, what took you so long? Why were you doing that? He says, it wasn't until that he didn't have any more strength left that I could save him. Because if he still had strength, he would have taken me and him down. And that is something that we need to know and understand. That we can't live a life of excellence until we've fully surrendered to God. That we've fully given him control of our life. That it's nothing that we can come up with, but it's through that full surrender of giving ourselves over, of drowning in his grace and allowing him to sweep us up so that he can truly save us. Amen? Amen. Can I get the worship team to come forward? So this morning as... As we close in prayer, maybe there's there's something in your life that that, that that you're still struggling with that you haven't given over to the Lord yet this morning. Or like I I felt that there was an impression last night in our time of prayer that that there's walls, some walls in our own life that are holding us back from God really moving. Because I think that there's some areas in our life that God wants to bless us in. But it's not until we fully let go or that we actually start to pursue with the energy that he has given to us through his grace and through his spirit. But that there's something that might be holding us back. And as we go into this time of worship, if that's you, if you want prayer, I want to be able to pray with you. Or maybe you've never fully given your life over to Christ. You haven't fully come into that place of drowning because in new life, there has to be a dying of an old life. And so if that's you, if you want prayer to begin a new life with him, I want to be able to pray with you this morning. But also what we do every Sunday is when we get time to sing after a message that we ask, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? Because Levi said a lot this morning, but what are you speaking to my heart and to my life that needs to bring change so that there can be a transformation? So if you need prayer for anything, maybe you're going through through some, some somewhat of an illness, struggle in relationship, finances, marriage, whatever it might be, that, that we want to be able to pray with you. My dad and I are up here. We'd love to pray with you. But as we go into this song, allow the Holy Spirit to speak directly to your heart so that we can continue or make the final decision to live a life, an authentic life of excellence. Amen. Let's stand.
Hallelujah. We thank you for making us new creatures, new creations, new DNA. Through your power, through your love, through forgiveness, through your experience of coming into a right relationship with you, God. We thank you so much for calling us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. We ask, God, that you would continue to use us to be your vessels in this earth, to display your glory, to display your extravagance, to display your excellent love to those around us. We thank you and we praise you. We thank you for all that has taken place here this morning and that it would continue to propel us forward this week as we are continually disciples after you, God. We thank you and praise you. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be blessed this morning. We've got some goodies back there. Speaking truth when I can't find it. 